Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the MLOS Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program. Previously on Saturday Morning Physics. Although you can think about electrifying personal transportation, you can hardly imagine flying an airplane with batteries. The sunlight comes down, warms the surface of the Earth, it's transparent to the sunlight, but when it goes back up, it's infrared radiation. And that radiation is not transparent. It has to work its way out, just like heat. When you sleep under a blanket, it has to work out. It's not that you're putting out more heat, but you get warmer because it's harder to push out the heat that you do have when you're under the blanket. Our energy needs will double. We can somehow have the amount of emission. If you read this report, you'll find that all our hopes are pinned down carbon capture and sequestration. So what is that? We do business as usual, but before we release the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we try to clean up the back end of this process. If you wanted to use corn ethanol to provide the world's needs, you would need 80% of the world's land area. There's no way that we're going to devote 80% of the world's land area, average over latitude, uh, night and day and seasons to growing corn for this purpose. I love solar, but I think it has a big problem. Suppose we talk about one foot square of solar panels. So that one foot square is going to capture on average, right, over seasons, over day and night, <coughs> of 23 uh, watts at 0.2 efficiency. That gives you 4.6 watts of electric. That solar panel, it's going to cost you $100 for that square foot. It will last 20 years. Other plants last 40 years. So you can need two of these. So you have $200 for this. Okay. So how much to produce the same amount of electricity does it cost for a coal-fired power plant? It costs you about $16 to build. And then 40 years supply of coal. Coal is cheap in the United States, and it will last you 40 years at $35. So it's $51. So this is a big problem, right? It costs you 200 for solar, and if you burn coal, it's $51. We have done this experiment in California. We have done this experiment in Europe. If we think that this is the answer, my personal view, you know, we're bordering on insane behavior. So my personal view is that we should focus on carbon capture and sequestration. The infrastructure is there. <clears throat> we have to focus on making biofuel at scales without subsidies. Okay? Scale is the problem. See, a lot of people are trying to make biofuel by biological means. What does that mean? In biology is chemistry at room temperature. At room temperature, no reaction goes fast. If it went fast, you'd be dead. OK? <laughs> so that's not a good way to make biofuel at scale. If you want to make biofuel at scale, you have to do it at high temperature. Any chemist will tell you that. Okay? So we're probably not taking the right uh, approach here. And then to make nuclear safer and more affordable with a long-term solution for the waste. So let me go back to this plot showing you. So you can see that the lower curve in the temperature has uh, come back. It's, it's a plateau, and then it comes back. And you see, once the ice is gone, you start to rise, and eventually you have the same slope as the beaker without ice. <laughs> so the temperature to uh, recover 30 degrees of uh, temperature is about the same amount of time as uh, the, the plateau takes. Okay, so the ice withholds it for. Uh, uh, let's say, uh, you know, it takes 100 years uh, before we're going to melt all the ice. And then, in another 20 years, we'll get to 6 degrees, OK? And if we don't, aren't careful, another 100 years, it'll be, you know, 120 degrees instead of 60 degrees if we uh, keep going the way we go. OK. <clears throat> 
uh, I think also you probably saw, I hope you were watching, the carbon dioxide. You can see the amount of carbon dioxide in the upper thing here versus the amount in the other beaker. Uh, the one without ice produced a lot less carbon dioxide that came out of the um, um, soda than the one that had uh, without ice, right? So once ice isn't there, you produce a lot more, release a lot more carbon dioxide. Okay, so let me talk now about uh, nuclear fission. <coughs> um, so nuclear fission starts, and we're going to show another experiment. When you have things that are big nuclei, that contain lots of protons and neutrons, those are the black and red uh, things. <coughs> For example, uranium-235 has 92 protons and uh, 143 neutrons. 143 is an odd number. Anything with an odd number of neutrons is fissionable. If you add a neutron to it, <coughs> because if you have an odd number of neutrons, neutrons have spin, one of them will be unpaired. And so if you come in to pair it, it gives a little more energy, and it's enough to vibrate it apart to make it split into two. Okay? And, and in splitting it into two, it will release energy. How much energy? Well, per kilogram or per pound, such a nucleus has 2.3 million times more energy than the same amount of coal. Coal is tremendously energetic in terms of chemical energy. How much more energetic? If you have a pound of coal, it has 40 times more energy than a lithium ion battery. 40 times more. That's why it's hard to build an electric car. Okay, gasoline has even more per pound than coal. And it's so cheap. That's why it's so hard to beat these things. But you have a chance with nuclear because it's 2.3 million, million times more than coal. So that's why we would like to do it. Now, if this neutron comes in fast, uh, it's less likely to, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, the, the, the nucleus is less likely to capture that neutron. So you would like to slow it down, okay, when it comes in. That's called moderation. So as long as it has a heavy thing with an odd number of neutrons, it becomes fissionable. Uh, 235 is fissionable, but it's only 0.7% of all uranium. So for example, most of the uranium is 238. 238 is an even number. If you subtract 92, it's still even, so it's not fissionable by itself. But if you add a neutron to 238, then it becomes 239. It doesn't like having so many neutrons, so two of those neutrons will decay to become protons. They become plutonium-239, and plutonium-239 is fissionable, okay? But it has to be made, and we do make it artificially. Similarly, thorium. Thorium only comes in one form, 232. If you add a neutron to it, doesn't like so many neutrons to become protons, and it becomes uranium-233, which again has an odd number of neutrons, so it becomes fissionable. So all these things are fissionable, but only this one exists naturally. But you can make this, okay? <clears throat> so fission is interesting in that if you come in with one neutron, you get out, on average, two or three neutrons. And that's because <laughs> this big thing is neutron rich, when it splits into these small things, it doesn't like even proportionally so many neutrons, so it spits out occasionally another one or another two or even another three, okay? And that's good news because if it's greater than one, in principle, you can have a chain reaction because it's bigger than two, in principle, in addition to the chain reaction, you can make what was not fuel into fuel. That's called breeding. Okay. Now, we're going to illustrate this. First, uh, uh, Monica is going to drop a ping pong ball into this uh, case where we have mouse traps. And if you spring the mouse trap, it's going to release another uh, uh, ping pong ball or neutron. And also, the mouse trap will jump and also hit other things. But 
If you don't have enough, if you don't have a critical mass of these things, you'll see it'll fizzle out. Because although additional neutrons are being produced, sometimes they hit the walls, don't do any good, or they hit the floor, they don't do any good. So Monica, please show us how this works. Whoops. <laughs> Here, I'll help you. So you can see, it, it goes for a while, but it fizzled out. That's because it's subcritical. In the meantime, she's going to pack more into here, so we have a critical mass of uh, uh, these things, or a, a supercritical mass. Then we can have a chain reaction. Now, you don't want this chain reaction to run away. If it ran away, it would release so much energy so fast, it would become a bomb. That's what an atomic bomb is. Reactors are not bombs. They are designed so they are exactly critical. That is, one produces only one more neutron. The others come out of the thing to be captured by uh, the walls, which make them radioactive, or better, to make things which are not fissionable into things which are fissionable, and that's called breeding. So, it's not made not bombs because there are two types of neutrons, ones which come out immediately and those which come out because the fission products themselves are spitting out neutrons. These, the fast ones, you have no way of controlling. Right? They come out, they hit another guy in a microsecond or so. There's no way you can control that. So you have to be subcritical with respect to these prompt neutrons. But if they are critical with the delayed neutrons, those come out over milliseconds to seconds to minutes, even hours, <coughs> you can control those. And that's what a reactor is. So when people talk about nuclear energy being dangerous because a plant might explode, that's baloney. Right? It's impossible for it to go off like a bomb. Right? What is dangerous about a nuclear reactor is even though the reaction stops, you stop it, let's say, by inserting something that absorbs the neutrons, the, radio, the fission products are still radioactive. Right? They not only occasionally spit out neutrons, they spit out <coughs> helium nuclei, alpha particles, or spit out energetic electrons, or spit out energetic photons, alpha, beta, and gamma radiation as Marie Curie showed many years ago. So those continue to release heat. That, <coughs> and that heat is a lot. Typically, it's 6.5% before you shut off the reactor. Right after you shut off the reactor, it's 6.5%. After about an hour, it's 0.6%. So, is that a lot of energy? Well, a nuclear reactor in maybe the first three rows of seats here produces maybe three billion watts of energy thermal. So if I take 0.6% of that, all right, that's like uh, 200 megawatts okay, of energy in this size. So imagine 200 uh, megawatts, that's 2,100,000 watt bulbs. Suppose I could place them in this seat. It gets hot. How hot does it get? It gets hot. <laughs> hot enough over time to melt anything. That's called a meltdown. Okay? So you've got to get rid of that heat when you shut it off. It's not easy. Because if an accident occurred, something happened to your cooling system, and you have to put in an additional cooling system to take away that heat. That's what happened in all the nuclear accidents that we had. Okay? Improper removal of that decay heat. So, uh, um, they're setting up the uh, supercritical thing. <coughs> the other problem, of course, is if you have a meltdown and you destroy part of your containment, this radioactivity will be released into the environment. All right? And <coughs> since it's radioactive, it's dangerous to human health. The most of the danger comes if it's kept in the body or it emits gamma radiation. So because of Fukushima, lots of people have heard about D3 nuclides. Iodine-131 
It has a half-life of eight days, so most of it is gone by now. But while it was around, because iodine is uh, absorbed in the human body and concentrates in the thyroid, that's very dangerous. All right? <clears throat> Cesium-137 is dangerous because it has a half-life of 30 years, and it emits gamma rays as part of its decay chain. Gamma rays are the most penetrating of radiation, so we don't like that to be released. And then finally, strontium-90. Strontium is in the same family as calcium, although it's not that radioactive. When kids drink milk that's been contaminated by strontium, it gets incorporated. In, oh. <laughs> so you can see why you want to control <laughs> nuclear reactions. OK, so we want to control D3. I'd, I'd like you to remember those, iodine, cesium, and strontium. We don't want them to get loose. But notice, most of these decay products, the half-life is 30 years. That's a long time, but eventually they do decay. Okay, And in that sense, radioactive elements are less dangerous than to chemically toxic things, because Toxic chemicals stay around forever. Radioactivity is dangerous only while it's active. Eventually, it does decay. So one of the things that decays, too, all the married folks, look at your wedding band. That gold band used to be radioactive. Came out of a supernova. Everything between iron and uranium at one time was radioactive. That's nuclear waste you're wearing. You don't have to be scared of it. Eventually, it becomes safe. It becomes valuable. <laughs> OK, so I'm sorry about this slide. It's a little, it just shows us that the technology we have is only one kind today. But in fact, we had other choices. We do have other choices. Today, we mostly use uranium-235. We use them in the form of solid pellets that we put together into a critical mass in pack them in a reactor, and <clears throat> we burn the uranium-235. We make a fission, OK? That means, because uranium-235 is only 0.7% of all uranium, we're actually only extracting less than 1% of the energy that's potentially there in the uranium-238. A little bit of it gets converted to plutonium, which does get burned. But basically, today, we're using nuclear energy at a 1% efficiency. We use 1% and we throw away 99%. Well, not quite. We find it difficult even to throw away the 99%, OK? <clears throat> now, you can ex enrich uranium. You have to enrich uranium. But that, that, that just means you leave behind a bigger amount where you took the uranium-235 and put it into this pile, that pile. It has, uh, is not usable. So overall, we're using it at 1% level. And plus, we can't get complete burn up because the radiation will damage these solid pellets, you know, these fast particles that come out do radiation damage. So they make metals brittle, et cetera. So you have to periodically refuel, change the pellets. The waste is a big problem. Because since you produce some plutonium, plutonium has a half-life of 24,000 years. And roughly speaking, you need to wait 10 half-lives before something becomes safe. So that's 240,000 years. So that's the problem with nuclear waste. We want to store it in Yucca Mountain, but they say, can you guarantee that it will stay safe for 240,000 years? We have no experience with that. So nobody can guarantee it. So we're stuck. It's <clears throat> OK. But if you can burn the plutonium, if you can transform the uranium-238 into uh, 239 plutonium, and you can burn all that, then all you have left is fission products. And then 10 times 30 years is 300 years. So you can ask, 
Can we store things safely for 300 years? Yes, let's go to your local museum. I'm sure they have lots of human artifacts from 300 years. That technology we had thousands of years ago. Whoops. This is called an accident. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so that's much easier. The other way of doing it is not to use either uranium or plutonium, but to make uranium-233 out of thorium. That differs from these two in that the elements are not solid elements, but is a liquid. It's in fact molten salt. Salt is very corrosive, and it dissolves lots of things, including uranium, plutonium, etc. So that becomes your fuel. So you get 100% here, although there's radiation damage, when it becomes damaged, you take it out of the reactor, you melt it down, you extract the bad things that will absorb neutrons, you put back the fuel, add back a little more fuel, and you burn it a little more. So you burn a few percent of time, over time, you can burn all of it. That's 100%. Here it's much easier, because you never produce plutonium, you don't have to worry about plutonium. And because you have a fluid, you can just keep circulating it. All right? And because it's a liquid, you can do chemistry to remove the bad stuff online. So again, since you're only left with fission products, the waste problem becomes 300 years. All right? But this becomes much easier because a liquid doesn't have a crystal lattice to destroy. Moreover, an ionic liquid has no chemical bonds to destroy, so it's actually not harmed by the radiation. So this is much simpler, why lots of people think this uh, last column has a lot of potential. So <clears throat> how much do we have? Well, uranium high-grade ore will last 100 years if we use it at the present rate, about 6% total. If we want to use it at 100% to provide all the power we need, you see these two numbers get inverted, it's six years. So this is the argument that anti-nuclear people make. Nuclear energy is not sustainable. If you try to use all of it, it only lasts six years. What would be the point? But if you can use 100%, it becomes 600 years. And if you use thorium, thorium is three to four times more abundant than uranium, so it lasts 2,000 years. It's not ultimately uh, like renewables, but hopefully by 2,000 years, you know, we'll have fusion, all right? If we don't have fusion by then, we should kick all the plasma physicists out of <laughs> physics department. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, to slow down the reactor, the neutrons, you use water, all right? To slow down the neutron, you have to some, the best thing to use is something that has the same molecular weight, uh, the same mass as the neutron, which a proton has. And of course, there's uh, hydrogen, which has protons and water. So that's the best thing. It's very convenient. It slows down the neutron. It absorbs some of the neutrons. But that doesn't matter if you're not trying to make a breeder, which is what the one through thing here. Here, you can't afford to absorb the neutrons. So it uses fast neutrons to breed. These are these prompt, <coughs> uh, fast things that come out. And uh, that makes a less safe, but you know we have the technology to do it. <clears throat> uh, uh, so it's not bread. But you need much more fuel to get a critical mass. Here you use graphite to slow it down. All right? Graphite, carbon, can slow down neutrons, not as well as water, but it will still do it if you have enough. And it doesn't absorb neutrons. So that's why it's good for breeding. The coolant here is also water. All right? Here is liquid sodium. Any chemist hearing liquid sodium says, uh-oh, that's not safe. It touches air, you have a fire. If it touches water, you have an explosion. But you know, this is the route that most people have followed if they want to go beyond this. Only a few groups have decided to go this route. Here, it's the salt that is a coolant. All right? It's a fluoride salt. Uh, say sodium fluoride, beryllium fluoride, or some combination. That, that won't burn, won't explode. It's sort of at a minimum of the chemical uh, bond, uh, binding. It has maximum chemical binding. 
All right, now you want to control it. So maybe we can set it off again. You can imagine that if this tries to run away, I can control it if I had Velcro balls and Velcro over here. So some of them that hits the walls would absorb it in such a way that one produces only one neutron. Unfortunately, we don't have that ready. But anyway, let's look at this again because it's so much fun. So this has run away because we don't have any control rods. Okay? So that's how it's controlled. <laughs> Okay, so these are with neutron control rods. You stick rods in to control them. This doesn't need control rods. Why doesn't it need control rods? It's the following reason. You have a liquid. If the reactions run too fast, it gets hot, and the liquid expands. So it expands out of the box. It's no longer part of the critical mass. So it controls itself. And Oak Ridge proved this 50 years ago. They could leave for the weekend, the thing would run itself. It didn't need control rods. When I saw this feature, I realized this is exactly the same principle why you can count on the sun. The sun is a gas. When the reactions run too fast, these are fusion reactions, it gets hot, a gas will expand, it will automatically cool down to slow down the rate of reaction. So you can count on this reactor to control itself in the same sense that tomorrow you can count on the sun to rise and warm you about the same as today. It's not quite, it gets a little colder because of the motion of the earth, but the sun itself is steady, okay? So you don't need to worry about this uh, reactor, or if you do worry about this reactor, you should also worry about the sun. So here's how it works, okay? We can solve our current nuclear waste problem by taking light water spent fuel, take the uranium out. Let's not make any more plutonium, that's dangerous stuff. Separate it out, uranium is different from all the other stuff, so chemically we can separate it, and we should bury this stuff in Yucca Mountain, okay? Or if Nevada doesn't like it, you can give it to Bill Gates, he claims he can burn this thing in a traveling wave reactor, or it's equivalent that many people have been studying, this fast breeder reactor using liquid sodium. Burn up all the plutonium. Or you can, <coughs> left over now are the plutonium and heavier things and the fission products. Fission products will absorb neutrons, so let's take them out. They're different from these guys. They can be separated. And now we just bury them. 200 meter, uh, two meters underneath the earth, just like we do with people. After 300 years, we shouldn't throw it away. You should go back there. You dig it up. There will be lots of stuff, very valuable, okay? <laughs> just like gold, okay? So that's, I think, the proper solution. Michigan, you want nuclear power? Bury it in Michigan. Don't say, Nevada, you take our waste. I don't think that's fair, right? But here, every place can have their choice. You want to use nuclear power, you take care of it yourself, all right? Just like we bury people. So the plutonium is fuel. So we put it into the core. We can have nuclear reactions. The excess neutrons, you only want one of them in here. The other <coughs> uh, one, uh, over one, you let come out here. Irradiate the thorium blanket and that were converted into uranium-233. When you made the uranium-233, you put it into here. And the exons, neutrons, make more uranium-233. So at that point, you don't have plutonium anywhere in the world, and you have uranium-233 that gives a breeder. <coughs> now, uranium-233 is very easy to reprocess because the uranium exists in the salt as a fluoride, uranium-F4. And to get it out, you don't need to touch it or anything. You just add some fluorine gas. It will turn into uranium uh, UF6, which is a gas. It will bubble out of this liquid, and you condense that gas. Uh, you've recovered uranium. That is a very safe process, because usually in making uranium-233, you will also make some uranium-232. You knock out that extra neutron. Uranium-232 is useless for fission, but it's a very good 
proliferation, anti-proliferation agent because it emits gamma rays. So if you wanted to make a bomb out of this, you'd have to be willing to send a worker in every half hour because that worker is going to get all the bone marrow destroyed. There are people who are probably willing to do that, but even if they assemble that bomb, if they try to bring it in to this country, even in a cargo container, it's very easy to detect gamma radiation. So nobody has ever succeeded making a bomb out of uranium-233. The United States tried, because in those days we could do everything. Not like today, when we can't do anything. <laughs> in those days, we did try making a bomb with uranium-233. It wasn't pure uranium-233. It had some plutonium, and the uranium-233 in it just caused it to fizzle. It wasn't. So no country that wants want to make a bomb would go this route. All right? <clears throat> Much easier to make a plutonium bomb. The challenge is in breeding, because on average, U-233, when it fissions, gives you 2.49 neutrons. Now, you need one of them to sustain the, to sustain the chain reaction, so you're down to 1.49. <clears throat> but not every neutron absorbed by thorium will cause a fission. Some of it will become thorium-230. <clears throat> uh, uh, Sorry, so uranium-233 will cause a fission. Some of it will become 234, which is not useful. And so if you take that into account, it drops it down to 1.23. Remember, you have to be above 1 to breed. Now, <clears throat> typically the salt is not totally transparent to neutrons, so you, it will drop it down to 1.09. You have some bad stuff like xenon-135, very absorbent of neutrons. It's a gas, fortunately, so you can remove maybe 90% of it, but the 10% left will absorb 0.03. Uh, there are fission products that you can't clean completely or metals that you have around. So you can see it's not easy to make, otherwise people would have done it. But it's not impossible, and we think it can be done. Oak Ridge did not demonstrate a breed that was possible. They showed making a reactor that was very simple, very safe. <coughs> So I won't go into the details of this because I've uh, already overgone my time. Let me just point out a few things. I've already talked about why if the fuel salt expands, it's safe. If the temperature still rises, you see something's going wrong up here. So the temperature rises. We have here, by the way, blanket in this pool. We pump in the fuel salt. It goes up through these channels. The blanket salt is used as a coolant to <coughs> to it and channels that go parallel to it. This is all made out of carbon here, which both moderates and does the heat transfer. So if something goes wrong up here and the temperature still rises, then you have a way of moving it out of here. This is hard. Something's going wrong here, so you can't cool properly. So with a solid fuel reactor, you have no choice. You have to cool up here. But with a liquid fuel reactor, you see, you can drain it. The way you drain it is that you keep part of the salt frozen. All right? And when and the temperature rises, it naturally melts and it gets dumped into a tank. The tank is, has this funny shape because you don't want it to be concentrated in a small volume. You don't have any carbon in there, so it's subcritical, very subcritical. Moreover, you can air cool it because this is a very clean thing because you're removing the fission products online, so you can use air to cool it. Why is air a good coolant? Because you can lose water. You can lose salt. It's very hard to lose air. <laughs> if you lost air, you probably have bigger problems than just your reactor. <laughs> So you might imagine the pumps go out or the fans go out. You have multiple fans. Suppose they all go out. What's going to happen? So this is the worst case. It breaks out of this uh, dump tank, and you make it spread out on the floor in such a way that it becomes so thin that decay heat cannot maintain it to be molten anymore, and it freezes in less than 10 seconds. Now what about the iodine, the cesium, and the strontium? Well, iodine is in the same family as fluorine, so it's in the form of sodium iodide. It will freeze with the salt. Cesium is like sodium, so it's cesium fluoride. It will freeze with the salt. Strontium is like beryllium, so it, too, will stay in the salt and freeze. 
So it's not moving. It's all confined inside the building. To remove the other fission products, you do online distillation. That's chemistry. If you ask a chemist, you want to do chemistry, I give you a choice. You can do it in a liquid or you can do it in a solid. It's a no-brainer. Of course you use a liquid. Okay? In fact, in Chinese, the name for chemistry means is hua xue. It means to dissolve things into a liquid. Okay. So the solid salt is inert, has very low vapor pressure, so there's no radioactive gases. Take a go home, smell the salt. Can you smell it? No. Because it doesn't have much vapor. Okay. It's uh, chemically bound. Nothing likes to be bound to fluorine more than the alkali metals. These are, <clears throat> so nothing's going to uh, react with it. You don't get fires. You don't get explosion. On top of this, you build a big dome. So even if you had a terrible accident, it's confined. It's not possible to have Chernobyl. It's not possible to have a Fukushima. It's not possible for jets to crash into these things to release this. You know, the 9-11 terrorists did consider crashing an airplane into one of our nuclear reactors. And after much study, they decided nuclear reactor domes are intrinsically so strong that it's easier to attack the Pentagon. Think about that. Easier to attack the Pentagon than to attack the nuclear reactor building. So this is what we call walk away safe. If everything, you know, everybody screws up, all the worst things happen, it's a perfect storm, still you can walk away just as those Oak Ridge people do over the weekend, and it would be safe, it would be contained. Okay? You'll have occasional spills, but it'll be safe. You're not going to have these major accidents. So let me end here by just saying you can use salts to heat up biomass, turn it into charcoal, condense the vapors that are driven off to uh, produce biofuel. And we have a way to do this very quickly. We've shown this. Here's the thing. You know, you can ask, why does a nature produce coal? How does it produce oil? How does it produce natural gas? Very simple. You bury plant matter deep in the earth where there's no oxygen. You let it touch hot rock over millions of years, hundreds of millions of years. If it dries out, it'll turn into coal. There's acid, other stuff around that turn into oil. If it gets too hot, it'll turn into natural gas. We want to do what nature does, but in 10 minutes. Okay? So how do we do that? We use liquids, don't use gases, all right? So to exclude <laughs> out here where you have air to a place where you don't have air, you make it do underwater swimming, okay? So you have a barrier here where you have water. You go under the water, you come back out where the air has been expelled. Now you're in an airless environment. So when this stuff goes in and gets hotter and hotter, it's not going to burn because there's no air. Over here, we have a molten Salt pool is not the same kind of salt. It's a different kind of salt, but we know. <clears throat> and you, it's 300 degrees. You let it circulate for 10 minutes, and out it comes as this charcoal that I showed you. OK? All right? So we're going to do it in 10 minutes. You can see I haven't put in a scale because you can make as much as you want, okay? depending on how much you want. And this stuff is hot when it comes out, so this stuff is cold, so it rises at some intermediate temperature. The biomass, as it goes in, gets hotter and hotter. The bio coal, as it comes out, gets colder and colder. And by the time you're out here, it's not going to catch on fire. <clears throat> then you collect the vapor. All right? So you can do this. It'll take land. Uh, the best thing about this is, in a pinch, if we really get desperate, we don't burn this coal. Instead we put it back in the ground. And then we're reversing what we've done badly for these centuries. We've been digging out coal of the ground and burning it. Now we say, let's make coal, but let's put it back. <laughs> and then every year, you can extract carbon dioxide. The plants will extract the carbon dioxide. And we're putting it back into the ground. Coal does not rot. You can have a bag of charcoal in your garage. And after years, after thousands of years, it will not rot. If you the biomass that's in, you know, gets pretty stinky, <laughs> okay, it will rot. This will not put carbon dioxide back in the atmosphere. 
So let me uh, finish, I'm sorry to have gone so long, by summarizing, okay? Reversing climate change is still possible, but scientists must speak up, all right? We are the ones who are the experts in this field, and yet we're letting policy being driven by people who don't understand science, okay? Who just have uh, uh, wants, all right? But without the capacity, perhaps, to judge what can uh, fulfill the needs. And environmentalists must stop opposing nuclear power. Environmentalists, I consider myself an environmentalist. This should not be a political debate. We're all in the same boat. It should not be, you know, liberals like uh, wind and solar and conservatives like nuclear and fossil fuels, okay? I consider myself a liberal, but I like nuclear power. It should not be based on new political decisions. We're all in the same boat. And right now, environmentalists must, realize, must come to realize that by opposing nuclear power, they are, have become the biggest threat to the environment. So, <clears throat> on this note, <clears throat> I would like to say that realistic energy policies need to be science-based assessment, not emotion-driven arguments that stalemate meaningful action. And on this, I'd like to end by quoting John Fitzgerald Kennedy, who talked about peaceful coexistence of a different kind. But I think we need peaceful coexistence now between environmentalists and science-based uh, reasoning. He talked about existing, uh, <coughs> coexisting with the Soviet Union. Here's what he said. This is the year I graduated from MIT, so I remember this speech. It was tremendously inspiring. So let us not be blind to our differences, but let us also direct our attention to our common interests and to the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit the small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future, and we are all mortal. Thank you very much. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lewis Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program.